proper here. So welcome everybody. We're going to be fielding any questions at all about bagpipes today for the show. Be sure to live subscribe if you're watching on Facebook so that you get notified of future updates. And uh, without further ado, we're going to start the show and then we are going to uh, rock and roll with a few questions. I have a couple up my sleeve uh, as well to get us started. So here we go. Okay, and we are back, which is uh, very exciting. So uh, the um, first question from my wife, Stephanie, is how do you make bagpipes quieter? Uh, the answer to that question is um, it's not really going to happen, probably, if you're playing the full Great Highland bagpipe, but maybe if you're playing small pipes or electronic bagpipes, there's a volume knob on those. Uh, honey, you just have to buy me a nice fancy set of electronic bagpipes, and I will uh, make sure I play those uh, regularly. What's going on? Hey, guys. So uh, we have Guy here. We have Andrew that just chatted in. Uh, Billy is also here. Welcome, guys. Really good to see you. Uh, just for anyone tuning in, uh, this is an open Q&A. So, uh, you know, a lot of the content is going to be reliant on your contribution. Um, I will go through a couple of the questions that we've had um, on our Facebook wall and group, you know, over the past little little while, because we've had some really good questions come through. Um, we'll start with uh, Guy's question from earlier today on the forum that we have, which is uh, exclusively for Dojo U Premium members. But uh, some of these questions are really good, and I'll share them with you now. So, uh, just a fun question from him. So uh, apparently, there's a sheepskin bag involved. Kane drone reads, but he's asking about the plastic stock that goes in the blowpipe that splits apart. We call that a split blowpipe stock, um, and that allows us to put a water trap in, in the instrument, which is, uh, you know, for many people who play sheepskin, standard uh, equipment. Um, and he's asking, does that plastic stock have any effect on the overall sound or timbre of the instrument? Um, which is kind of a good question, right? Like you're always wondering, okay, so I'm putting in a non-authentic, you know, definitely, um, you know, machined on a piece of plastic. Is that going to negatively impact the instrument? So the answer there is, in all my experience, that does not uh, have a negative timbral effect on the instrument. Does it change the overall timbre of the instrument? Probably, but it's on such a microscopic, insignificant level that you would never be able to tell the difference. And meanwhile, most pipers feel that in being able to have that water trap through the split stock, uh, you know, is a good thing, is a beneficial thing. And so if there is any difference, it would just be very, very negligible and uh, worth the trade-off. Meanwhile, my split stock on my pipes uh, are actually made out of a wooden piece. Um, I think I had someone cook that up for me way back in the day where they took the actual original blowpipe stock from nail uh, and split it for me um, and put that insert in so that I can, you know, have an even more authentic um, split stock. And it's just, you know, it's good aesthetically, but it's probably also good on a quantum level, you know, like on a very microscopic level, it's probably just that tiny bit better uh, for the timbre of the instrument. And you might be saying like, Andrew, you full of crap, like what difference could that possibly make? Uh, but I'm a firm believer, and I have a lot of experience and evidence to back this up, that the overall embouchure of our instrument, okay, of the reservoir itself, of the bag that we use, the overall embouchure uh, plays into the sound of the instrument. So anything that you do to affect the overall space in which all this air is hanging out, uh, <clears throat> you know, before it exits the instrument, Okay, like that's going to play a small role. Picture, you know, embouchure, which usually refers to the shape of the mouth when you're playing a woodwind or a brass instrument. Embouchure is a big deal, right? The, the way that you shape your mouth affects, you know, how your overall instrument responds and how it resonates. Okay, so uh, I am a believer in some quantumly small, I'm, uh, for some reason I'm on that word quantum today, but 
uh, in some really small way, uh, you know, that does have an effect. Um, there was a follow-up question about when I use the drone dry, uh, which are special stocks, you know, and uh, I don't use them anymore, but they were a really cool product. And again, I think it did have an ever so slightly negative impact on the timbre of my instrument, right? Because the inside of that stock is not really authentic, like um, really hard wood anymore. Instead, it's the a poly pinko plastic material. Uh, I think it had ever so slightly negative effect on the tone, but uh, was the trade-off worth it? The, um, the desiccant that you know, keeps moisture off from the tongues of your synthetic reeds, is that trade-off worth it? And the answer is maybe, you know, maybe it is. Um, it, you know, these are all really high-level questions, and I would also say that for the vast majority of us, right, there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing really that we want to be doing to mess around with it. Yeah, like the split plastic stock is perfectly fine. Simple water trap. You know, we don't want to get too fancy, though. Like, you know, I, I personally don't advocate moisture control systems for beginners and intermediate players, uh, largely because, right, all those little hoses and hookups and weird contraptions inside of your bag uh, mess with the overall embouchure inside the bag and can have a negative impact on the timbral quality or you know you might call it harmonic response maybe you know you might just call it overall sweetness of the instrument um, there are lots of people out there you know who have differing opinions there i think a lot of us train ourselves to believe that it doesn't have an impact just because we want those moisture control you know things to be the right thing for us uh, it's up to you. I like to live in Realville as much as possible uh, and acknowledge that anytime you mess with the inside of the bag and the way that the air flows and the overall shape and embouchure, it's going to have uh, a downside in timbral quality. So that's a that's a expanded answer to that question that we've had in the forum. So uh, we've got some folks tuned in live. Uh, we really do want your questions here to make the uh, to make this broadcast a little bit more interesting. Andrew uh, is asking what band I'm in. Uh, currently at the moment, uh, I have joined the Inverarian District Pipe Band over the winter, and I've been playing with them as a long-distance player. So um, at the moment, the arrangement is uh, that I, I, you know, I, I've been to two of the major competitions in Scotland, flew over and did those. Uh, kind of whirlwind trips where I fly in, get in on like a Thursday morning, practice with the band Thursday and Friday, uh, and then perform with them on the Saturday, uh, which, has been, which has been a blast. I'll be over for a little bit longer for the run-up to the Worlds to prepare with the band, and then I'll play with them at the World Pipe Band Championships. So I hope that answers your question. And uh, yeah, that's been, you know, pretty pretty amazing experience, and I would I would say that uh, a lot of players in our band are playing that very setup we just talked about, including myself, sheep and cane with a water trap. Uh, many of us are playing that exact setup, which is, uh, you know, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, let's scroll down here. We've had lots of good uh, questions uh, in the forum over time. Guy, you're great with the questions on the forum. I, I, I love when they come in and we love uh, answering them. Uh, there was a question yesterday about different types of hemp. Okay, this is like a big, this is a big question everybody has, especially like as the world kind of takes a little jaunt back towards old school land, you know, like we get the sheep and a lot of people are playing cane drone reeds again, which is awesome and uh, it's producing a really great uh, tambourine world with lots of great harmonics. They're starting to come back in style, which is great. Uh, but then uh, some other things get mistakenly grouped in with this. Okay, one of which is unwaxed old school hemp okay and a lot of people are wondering um, you know can I use plain hemp instead of waxed hemp and will that be you know will that uh, produce a good result and people have different theories here but the bottom line for me is no way Jose okay like uh, waxed hemp especially the factory wax stuff with a nice thick coating of wax uh, where they wax it for you that's 100% my go-to product all the time uh, I do a compression te uh, hemping technique, uh, which you'll see floating around Dojo Land if you search enough. Uh, you could probably even find it for free if you're clever. Um, a compression technique that 
helps keep the hemp from swelling and contracting too much with changes in moisture and temperature. But at the end of the day, there's two things that are true. Number one, waxed hemp is by far the best, right? It prohibits uh, moisture getting in and out of the hemp you know, to a high degree, much higher than if the hemp, hemp was unwaxed. Okay, and then number two is there's no such thing as bagpipe hemp that doesn't require uh, continual touch-up maintenance uh, to make sure it's the right tension. And that's just the way that the world works. You know, you could have African blackwood, which is one of the most dense materials, you know, in the natural world that I'm aware of, and even that is going to expand and contract in different conditions. So, of course, hemp is going to as well. Um, so, you know, people do all sorts of weird stuff. Like some people, I've seen this a lot now in the past couple of years, some people are taking one strand of unwaxed hemp, one strand of waxed hemp, and they're putting them together in like this little rope, and then they're using that, you know, a little bit of both worlds. That They find that's the best. There's no way that's the best. The hemp with no wax on it is going to take on moisture whenever it's available. And then whenever you're in a dry climate again, like when you dry your pipes out overnight, let's say, all that moisture is going to leave, and it's going to leave it contracted again. So anytime that there's no wax or other barrier to prohibit moisture going in and out, that's going to cause major maintenance problems. Okay? Now, meanwhile, regular old wax you know, uh, is going to produce a nice barrier for us. It's very easy to add or subtract a little bit of that, especially if you wrap it in an organized fashion. That's the way to go, 100%. That's my opinion. There are a million pipers that do a million different things. But for me, it's very straightforward. And I just do a little tiny bit of hemp maintenance every single day if I have to. Every time I get my pipes out, I'm checking all my different connections, making sure they're the way that I want them. And then I go forward uh, from there. So uh, let's see, Christopher, cool, we got some questions coming in here on the Facebooks, which is pretty cool. I watch them come in on my phone, and I'm actually broadcasting here from my computer. Uh, Christopher, thank you very much for tuning in. He says, I hear of people not wiping down their pipes with oil, and then I hear that some do. My opinion on the matter. So um, disclaimer here, you know, I purposefully don't have super valuable expensive bagpipes for reasons just like this. So I never have oiled my pipes, ever. I've been piping for a long time. I've never done it. Now, um, that's not to say Carl hasn't done it for me, insisting that I do it. <laughs> that's actually happened maybe once or twice where Carl's like, come on, you're an idiot. If you're not going to oil your pipes, I'll do it for you. And I think I've probably let him do it. And I remember when I played, um, I actually, when I played in the SFU pipe band uh, back in the 2000s, right? I was in the band from 2002 to 2007. I actually played a loner set of nail bagpipes when I was in the band. Uh, and I know those were oiled on, like, maybe when I first got them. They might have been oiled just so they're ready for playtime again. So some people definitely are into the oiling. Some people are, aren't. Um, the big thing to remember about oiling is um, you're, you just have to be careful not to lock any moisture in the wood by oiling, right? So oiling is supposedly good for the wood, keeps the wood conditioned, um, and then, you know, helps keep moisture from getting into the wood and causing cracks. Uh, the big warning thing there, and, and again, as you can tell, this is not my 100% area of expertise. It would be probably good to get somebody like a Dave Atherton or, or you know, a really astute bagpipe make, maker to comment on this. Uh, but you have to be careful you don't accidentally lock moisture in either. So you don't want to oil like the day after a long practice session. This is my very, like, my very rough understanding of this. So, um, you, you know, it, you would want to oil maybe after you had taken a week off, you know, and your pipes had, you know, had a chance to you definitely, uh, net, you know, equalize with the moisture um, so that you don't accidentally lock moisture in because, of course, that can cause cracks too. So just food for thought there. I would not take my, I would not take my answer, um, uh, you know, and uh, convert that into... <laughs> Uh, knowing a lot about oiling because like I said I I have a set of nails that sound great I've never oiled them 
you know, I, if they get absolutely saturated, I'll brush them out. But even after most practice sessions, I just let nature do its thing. I don't use brushes very often to brush them out. And I just kind of like uh, a very laissez-faire, hands-off approach to that sort of thing. And it's served me well. I've never had serious cracking issues, partially because nail bagpipes are really, really well made with great quality wood. Uh, but uh, that's sort of where I'm at with that. Great question, though. I know uh, soon, at some point, we can bring Carl on. He's definitely, he's played legacy, super valuable pipes for many years, so he has his routine that has served him really well. Guy says, what was your preparation like when you joined the band, meaning the Inverarian District Pipe Band? Uh, good question. So when you play in a band uh, at that level, the, they will generally have the competition sets. So there'll be two MSRs, two medleys, and then they will have some peripheral material as well. So I, I actually first joined the band just around the new year. And I had to kind of work hard to get all the material going. But uh, I just uh, got it all assembled in a music book. Just started playing through the tunes and got everything in my head a little bit. And then one by one, I drilled down on each of the tunes uh, to make sure that I had them memorized. Um, it's one of those things, though, like the, I think for me, the hardest part of playing in the band has been uh, having very limited reps with the group. Not so much because you need a lot of reps. So players at our level, especially myself having played in many top level pipe cores. I mean, when I played in SFU, rem remember for those who are up on your trivia, Stuart Little was in the band at the same time. So he and I are, you know, uh, we understand the same or, or very similar style. Obviously Inverary has a lot of nuances um, that Stuart and others bring to the group. So you kind of have to pick up on those. But overall, it's not really so much an issue of playing in unison. There's little adjustments I have to make. But the biggest thing, the most challenging thing for me is to not screw anything up due to lack of total comfort just because I haven't had uh, uh, the same number of reps as the rest of the group. So what will happen is you'll learn a tune uh, and you'll play it a million times with no stress when I'm practicing and preparing at home. But then as soon as you get into the group, um, you know, and the same is probably true on any highly competitive team. As soon as you get into the group, you immediately feel the weight of responsibility not to screw anything up. And that's, that's the biggest challenge, right? Is suddenly this tune that you've played a million times, suddenly you start to feel a little bit insecure because you want to make sure you don't make any mistakes. And so that's the number one thing. Uh, that I focus on in practice um, is just uh, visualizing being in the group, visualizing the other people in the group, and trying to put pressure on myself so I get used to that pressure so I can perform with total confidence uh, and a total lack of insecurity uh, or uh, with security uh, when I'm in the group because that's, you know, that's how you become a really strong contributor is just by having that confidence and, and doing everything well and just really doing everything in your power to avoid doing something that'll let the group down. Because remember, the vast majority of the group is local. They work really hard uh, several times a week in Scotland. And so I'm sort of a guest in the group, and it's my job to show up and not stink. So, uh, so far, so good. I've had two good performances, so I'm, I'm, work, I'm focused and working hard at the moment on... Um, you know, on continuing that and making sure, you know, I'm never a liability. Uh, and because, you know, at, at that high level of playing, you know, every little bit, help, you know, it counts. Every piper in the group has to be an absolute top form, and I have to be one of them. That's a good question, Guy. Uh, let me know if, that, uh, if that's a satisfactory answer or if you had anything more specific that you wanted to ask about uh, preparation. Billy says... I just rehemped my pipes with waxed hemp about uh, a month and a half ago. I've noticed the change from when I take it from my air-conditioned house into warm weather. You'll probably notice, Billy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, when you go from air conditioning out into warm, humid weather, the hemp will expand a little bit, right? Like that, and that, that's sort of common sense kicking in, which is, you know, that little bit of moisture in the air from the humidity 
sort of works its way in there and things will expand a little bit. Um, I actually sometimes when it's really hot outside and the air conditioning in my house is really cranking, I'll actually turn the air conditioning off, uh, you know, maybe a half hour before I start to play through my session. Yeah, I sweat a little bit more, but it allows my pipes to feel a little bit more normal and not in an artificially cool and dry um, environment. Cool and dry is very unrealistic for bagpipes. Um, should I be adding or taking off hemp to account for the swelling change? Yes. So you would obviously, if things are too tight, you're going to need to take off hemp when they swell. But then take into consideration what I was just saying as well, which is, you know, see if you maybe can limit the amount of time you spend in super dry, you know, artificial scenarios. So sometimes it's worth a little bit of extra sweat in your house um, in order to, you know, put the bagpipe in the best environment, most realistic environment. You know, along those lines, right, when you are preparing for any specific performance, you kind of want to prepare your bagpipe for that environment too. For example, if you're in a grade one pipe band and you're going to be playing on the grass, you know, outside in the grass uh, for the competition, it's in your best interest to practice you know, in a similar environment at a similar time of day, if possible. And I think you'll see most grade one pipe bands are going to be doing that the week of the worlds, is they're going to be practicing at the same time that they're going to be competing on the weekend and in the same type of environment. So, you know, that's just a, an overall rule of thumb for performance preparation. So, <laughs> Neil, this is a funny question. How many marginally different versions of Highland Wedding are you willing to learn in your lifetime? That's a good question. Thankfully, Inverary does not play Highland Wedding, so I did not have to learn uh, a, sl a slightly different. That's right, though. Like, a lot of bands play Highland Wedding, and usually every band has ever so slightly different setting. Now, in most situations, uh, oh, I will say this. Uh, Inverary plays um, a different setting of the tune Tullet Castle. Uh, and that's a great example of both questions that we've talked about. So first of all, uh, there's always these slightly different settings and you have to learn them. That's your job. And then second of all, that's a great example of where I'm liable to feel insecure unless I've really prepared with that. <coughs> so I can play that different setting a million times, no problem at home. The hard part is going into the band, you start to feel the pressure come down on you, you start to second guess whether you're remember, remembering the setting properly, and then suddenly you can end up in a, in a you know, space where you have kind of bad momentum, and you, know, you might be likely to make a bluter. So you just have to be careful. <coughs> really good question. Neil says, how often should a sheepskin bag be seasoned? Okay, the answer for me is um, you want to season the bag as little as possible. Okay, every time you season the bag, it decreases the lifespan of the bag a little bit. Just because you're rubbing mush onto leather. Um, so early in the lifespan of the bag, it's good for the bag, but the more you do it, you know, the less long it's going to last for you. So the pattern that I usually go through is you tie in the bag and it's brand new. You give it a really big seasoning at first and you, you're really careful uh, to get all the seasoning in the pores to the max <coughs> that very first time you season. Next, what usually happens is you need more seasoning very shortly thereafter because the bag soaks all that first round up. So you'll season it again probably within the first week. Then you'll probably season it again within the next 10 days to two weeks. But then once the bag is really broken in and things are really happening, you really shouldn't need to season it very often. Like maybe for me once every two months, and what's going on in my instrument right now is, you know, um, I 
sort of, I'm putting off the inevitable, right? So I'm putting it off. I'm actually waiting to season my pipes until the key moment, which will be probably about a week before I leave to go back to Scotland. That's when I'll season it again. I actually didn't season it before my last trip to Scotland, but, but yeah, so I'll, we'll find that the bag is kind of needing seasoning, probably even right now during my practice sessions. <coughs> Those of you who have played sheep for any amount of time know that usually if you just play it and get some moisture in it, it tends to tighten back up for you fairly well. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a little bit of a dry throat going on here. But, um, but then I'm going to season it to really get that thing airtight again, probably about a week before I leave for the Worlds, and that should do me um, until the day of the Worlds, and the bagpipe should be in a re really good shape. Um, when I do season it, I'm going to use very little seasoning, just barely enough to coat everything up uh, and to get things going, uh, but not so much that I'm going to oversaturate my bag, for lack of a better word. Okay, so this overall philosophy, I definitely kind of learned from Jack Lee, <coughs> you know, who, uh, you know, that was his overall philosophy, and I've adopted that, you know, when I was in the band, of course, and then now just in general. And that allows your sheepskin bag to last for at least two years, <coughs> if not longer. Okay, great question. Next one, do you play your pipes every day? And if so, how long? I want to play more and can't really play for hours and hours a day. 30 minutes is about all I can do. Why, because you get tired? Or for some other reason, like maybe you have too much moisture in the instrument? Okay, so this all depends on the type of player that you are. So I definitely play my pipes every day. Uh, and let, you know, some days I don't, but I, it makes me feel like I'm misbehaving and I'm not really being, you know, a diligent, um, a diligent player. So I try to play my pipes six days a week. Um, I'm a little bit, you know, um, you know, you're at, like, you also asked, what is the norm for top level players? So I am not currently a top level active solo player. If the, the, you know, the, the pipers that are playing P. Brock competitions at the highest levels, like the gold medal and the clasp and stuff like that, they're playing at least six times a week, probably for more than an hour at a time, right? Every single day, okay? So those are the top, top players that are in top form. For me, you know, I'm, I am playing every day. It's not likely to be a full hour every day for me. Uh, my routine sort of goes like this. I play my pipes for five to ten minutes, uh, usually in the morning before I teach my 7.30 a.m. class. So just around 7 a.m. every day, I play my pipes for five to ten minutes, get a little bit of moisture in the instrument, get things acclimatizing. I'll set my pipes down. I'll go teach my class. Then I'll come back and I'll play for a solid half hour to 45 minutes, um, usually on my band material. That's been my major uh, project for this year. I haven't done a whole lot of solo playing. If I were doing solo playing, I would mix that material in. Um, and that would sort of complete my practice session. Um, but if I were in serious P-Brock mode, uh, that would be expanded quite a bit. But yeah, um, definitely want to play your pipes for, you know, six days a week, I think is a healthy amount. If you're really serious about um, improving or keeping up a good form. Let's see. Yeah, and if you only have time for half an hour, that's fine. Just make sure you really use that half hour, right? Like, if you're just doing reps for a half hour, that's not practice. That's wasting time. So if you only have half an hour, you need to make sure t at least 25 minutes of that is actual focused work on developing your technique. Okay. Make sure you're spending at least 80% of your practice time working on the things that you are bad at. Um, Callum says he only places pipes 35 minutes a day. There you go. Cal uh, perfect. I think, you know, the thing about Callum, and I think the thing you'll find about the really tippy-top players, uh, it's also the way I keep my form going, is I do at least a little bit 
every day or on average six days a week. You know, some days, you know, at least one of the weekend days usually I'm off doing something interesting and can't really do it. Um, so there you go. And if, only, if all you have time for is half an hour, that, that can put you in a great position, especially as John McCain reports, uh, Callum only plays his pipes 35 minutes a day. I wouldn't be surprised if he plays more than that when it's leading up to key moments, just like I will, right? I'm going to go from, uh, you know, nice half hour comfortable sessions to closer to 45 minutes to an hour as I approach leaving for Scotland and gearing up for the world championships. Um, there, you know, there you go. Uh, Hugh asks, do I have an opinion on goat skin pipe bags? The answer is, I don't really have an opinion. Other than that, I've never had anyone say they're so much better than sheep that it's actually worth switching over. I've heard good things, but not great things about goat skin. And that's just me. Like, I could be totally wrong. I could come back to you in a few months after having tried a goat skin saying, this is the best bag ever. But at least where I'm at right now, I do not feel compelled to do anything different than sheepskin, um, you know, for my setup. And that's just where I'm at personally. Neil says, which moisture system do you recommend? I'm currently using Banatine canister. Uh, so Neil, let me ask you this, what level bagpiper are you like can you are you in a certain grade or what would you consider yourself beginner intermediate advanced um, there's a little bit of a delay folks so we just we'll wait for Neil to maybe um, get back to me and where I'm leading Neil with this is unless you are a super advanced player. The best moisture control system, hands down, is no moisture control system at all. Okay, so I'm a little, you know, I might be a little, that might seem a little controversial to those of us who, you know, <clears throat> have played moisture control systems a lot and that's what they're used to thinking about. Okay, so you are an advanced player, unless you're super advanced. Now, the definition of super advanced is if your drones drift out of tune ever so slightly, even the tiniest bit, you would, that would take you from winning to not being in the prize list. So, you know, a, a high-level professional player here in North America or uh, like a player in the A or B grades in, you know, that, that are hoping to take prizes in the A or B grades in Scotland would be another good example. Um, if you're at that level, I don't really know what I'd recommend. When I was you know, playing in the A grades in Scotland and in the silver medal, um, for the record, you know, I took five prizes in the silver medal in the three years that I did it. I was third twice and fourth three times. So I'm not just talking out of my rear here. Um, I played a Ganaway zipper bag with a Ross canister system. Uh, and that served me very well. I know that players are having a lot, you know, and again, this is only advice for super advanced players. Um, you know, a lot of players are playing the Banatine setup. Um, you know, there's new products that uh, intrigue me that, I would, that I'm probably going to experiment with uh, in the near future, the Trap Dry products, which uh, seem to get really good reviews as far as, it's sort of like a standard um, it's a passive system, so it's not actively extracting moisture using a desiccant. You know, those things really uh, interest me. Neil says he's advanced, but he doesn't want to sound big-headed. Yeah, um, as you can tell, it's not something I worry about too much. But uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, like, so Banatine, Ross, um, I always played it with the Ganaway zipper bag. Ganaway gives you that little bit of a hide a little bit of a hide tone uh, with that moisture control in there. Um, so there you go. Neil said, 
I have heard from quite a lot of pipers that the goat skin caused a lot of moisture. He says moisture system, but maybe moisture problems. Yeah, I can't, I cannot say for sure. I, I don't, I'm not educated enough on the goat skin. Um, good, these have been fantastic questions. Um, let's, I'll ask one more time for questions uh, that I can answer for you. But then otherwise we'll venture towards wrapping up because I do have a four o'clock appointment. Oh, someone hearted me. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Bing. Very exciting. Uh, any last questions? Thank you very much for tuning in, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, we'll wait a few more moments for any more questions. Then we'll venture towards wrapping up. Let's do a couple of housekeeping things. So you may or may not see a live subscribe option somewhere on your screen. It might be on the actual video. It might be somewhere in the comments. Definitely click that live subscribe button if you enjoy this kind of thing so that you'll just get a little notification in your Facebook when we go live so that you'll be able to join in when you're free. That's the best way for you to find out about these. Um, also, we will be posting this show on YouTube and in podcast form. So um, search for us on your podcast app or in YouTube. Subscribe to us there if you're a YouTuber. <clears throat> also, you can find us on Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, obviously on Facebook as well. So, you know, definitely help us by connecting in whatever ways you can. Definitely comment whenever you can because, uh, you know, we love to get that feedback. That's kind of what keeps us going. Ke you know, he having these questions here from you guys uh, has been great. Neil says, what sheepskin bag do I recommend? I recommend bag sheepskin bag. Um, of the sheepskin options, that's the most expensive, but it's kind of because that reputation has been earned. So you're always going to get a good product with bag, or if something is wrong with the bag, he's always very quick to correct it. Um, I know there are other bag makers emerging in the market, um, and you'll just have to ask around for what sort of success people are having with that. Okay, well, let's call it in there for today. Thanks again very much for tuning in. And this has been a uh, really fun Q&A. And I'll try to do an even better job next time promoting it. So you guys will know about it. But uh, yeah, thanks again. And we'll see everybody soon.